Okay. Hi, everyone. Hope you are doing. Hope you are doing well. Um, welcome to the session of Cafe Ole. My name is Jay Rosen. I'm a volunteer with Nefesh Benefesh. I myself made Aliyah with them um, <clears throat> just short of 15 years ago, actually. Wow, almost a month away from 15 years here. Um, and here at, Nefesh, at uh, Cafe Ole with Nefesh Benefesh, we go over the everyday Hebrew that you need here in Israel, whether that's about <clears throat> growing, grocery shopping or paying bills or following the news or the latest in slang, everything that you may not have learned in formal Hebrew education, be it Ulpan, a day school, a yeshiva, a university, or maybe you're not learning formally anywhere, but this is really to help you with the everyday Hebrew that um, you really do need in life here in Israel um, and will hopefully set you up for further success, whether you have already made Aliyah, whether you're planning on making Aliyah, this is really meant for all of you and very much at a beginner's level. Um, oftentimes there aren't many resources out there for a beginner's level to get into everyday Hebrew. Um, so we are glad to have you on the call. As you see, those of you who've been here before have watched our recordings on YouTube in the past. You see, I am now with what we call in Israel, Madonna. Madonna is what we call a headset with a built-in microphone in Israel. Um, it, you can figure out where it comes from. If you need some cultural uh, literacy there, um, think Madonna, early 1990s. One of her very iconic looks was um, this, was a, head, was a headphone set with a microphone built in. Um, in Israel, every tour guide, everyone who ever uses one of these things will call it a Madonna. It's a great, um, great piece of information further shows how prevalent American culture and American society here in Israel is. Um, but we're talking about Hebrew today. So um, if you've never joined us before, we're going to go through a topic um, that has been um, researched by me or and or submitted by you. We are always open to new ideas. So if you have further topics for us to um, cover, please write them in the chat box or send them to um, Nefesh Benefesh by email. We are always happy to, um, not only happy to get suggestions for further topics to explore, it's really important for us to make sure that this stays as user-friendly as possible. We wanna know what's important to you as Olim, what you need to learn about. That's also um, uh, relevant for everyone, right? Not how you specifically can go and make an appointment for your specific illness with a doctor, but, the issues about making an appointment like we did the other week when it came to allergies, right? Or we've done before with automated menus like we did last week. Um, uh, you can research, you can see all of our previous sessions on Nefesh Benefesh's YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com, type in Nefesh Benefesh, you'll see Cafe Ole will show up and all the previous sessions, including this one. Today, I believe in the original email, it said we're going to do media literacy. We're going to wait a week in the hopes that the top headlines will not be about Corona, because um, I think we've had our fill of that, although even in today's lesson, you'll get a little bit not the actual virus, of course. Um, but today we're gonna do a topic that is really important. Um, and I know is a major issue for native English speakers in general, um, but in particular for um, when learning Hebrew, and that's the issue of gender. Okay. Gender is already complicated for English speakers because we don't have gender, except for pronouns like he and she, we don't conjugate um, verbs with gender. We don't have nouns and adjectives don't have gender assigned to them. Whereas if you're learning another language, right? If you're learning a romance language, other languages, the nouns have gender, right? So if you're learning French or Spanish, you know this very well. And then the adjective that modifies that noun has to also be of that gender. Hebrew and other Semitic languages take it up a notch. It's not just nouns, it's not just adjectives that have to conjugate according to gender, it's also verbs. So you can't just say, I write, you have to say, you have to conjugate write depending on how you identify and your gender. So I'm gonna get, what we're gonna do today is not go through that, right? We're not going through something you can look up in a dictionary. Instead, I'm going to give you the workarounds. I'm going to give you the major expressions, the major ways, formulas in Hebrew that you can use that are 100% gender-free. 
right? They're not gender inclusive. And that's an important distinction to make. Um, this isn't the way that people are trying to write nowadays. And it's much easier to write in Hebrew gender inclusive. This is gender free, meaning formulas, expressions, sentences that don't require any conjugation whatsoever and thus are gender free inherently. So we're gonna go through those as I'm talking. If you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box. Just press on Q&A and type in your question. I'll go through as many of them as I can by the end of the hour. If you have any questions about anything else that's not related to this specific class, please write it in the chat window. If you don't like the color of the Madonna I'm wearing, if you have a, a suggestion for another class, please write that in the, Q in the chat box, Q&A box just for today's lesson. Okay, with that, let me share today's lesson. Okay, as always, um, you can follow along, you can old school pen and paper, you can take a screenshot. Again, you a recording of this class will go up on Nefesh Benefesh's um, YouTube channel within the next 24 to 36 hours. So if you didn't catch anything, you wanna go over it again, you have all the time in the world to go over this at your own leisure. You don't need to ask me for the sheets, you don't need to ask me for anything else, you'll get a copy of this. But definitely if you have questions and you're on the call now, please write them in the Q&A. Okay. So before we get to the gender-free expressions, I just want to go over gender in Hebrew. Now, there's a lot of functions about gender that um, in Hebrew that are important to learn. What I want to focus here in this class, like I already talked about being 100% gender-free expressions, I want to talk about the situations in which nine, more than 9 out of 10, let's say 9.7 out of 10, you can figure out the gender of something just based on how it's spoken or read. Right, because oftentimes that's a lot. Oftentimes when I'm teaching um, fellow Olim, especially fellow native English speakers, they'll all of a sudden raise their hand and say, wait a minute, Jay, but that's an exception. Oh, no, no, no. First off, exceptions in Hebrew are incredibly rare. Okay, it's natural for us English speakers to latch on to exceptions because English is full of exceptions. Ask someone who had to learn English from scratch, especially at an older age. It is one of the hardest languages to learn in part because of how many exceptions there are and how many irregularities there are. Hebrew, yes, there are some things. There are some things that can get explained even if they seem like an irregularity. But this is we're going over the things that are dependable, reliable, and will almost always confirm gender. So let's start with row two here, okay? Row two here. What am I talking about? We're talking about suffixes. As you may recall, we've talked about this before, but it's important to know, Hebrew uses a lot of prefixes and suffixes to give further meaning to words. Um, when it comes to suffixes, it tells us oftentimes about possession, but it also tells us about gender. That's where gender is often gonna be, not always, but often is gonna be at the end of a word. So here are two, two examples rather, of suffixes that give us a gender and that whenever we see these two endings, we can almost always be guaranteed we know the gender. In this case, in row two, we're talking about uh, masculine. Okay, so I gave you two examples here on the far right. Rusi or Rusi or Rusi, if you are if you are a Russian speaker, however you say that first word, and Yaldon. Okay, Rusi means a Russian person and Yaldon has the word yeled, boy or child, and on, okay? The suffix on often means something little. It always means something little. So yeled is already a boy or child. A yaldon is a little boy, a small child, okay? And the yud at the end of a um, word, we've talked about this is a lot, is how you transform a noun into an adjective. In Hebrew, it's very simple. It's the equivalent in English of adding ish or esk or any of those suffixes we often joke around uh, putting, but they actually mean um, that. So rusi means something that is Russian, okay? It's a person who's Russian or it can mean uh, little. Okay, uh, sorry, it can mean Russian meaning a person or a thing, but it's masculine. Just like yaldon, that on at the end means little. I saw someone just ask in the Q&A, but I thought katan means little. It does, 100% the word katan means little. 
But if you add the suffix on at the end of the word, it makes it little, right? It's the same exact thing as saying beti and habaycheli. They both mean my house. I just have two different ways of saying it in Hebrew. No difference in meaning. Beti, my house. Habaycheli, my house. Yeled katan, yaldon. Same exact meaning. Yaldon is usually considered smaller even than a yeled katan, but they mean the exact same thing. Great question. Okay. The reason why I said 9.7 out of 10 is what you see here in the notes on the left-hand side. Rusi can also mean my Russian something. My Russian uh, book. A sefer, uh, or my Russian person, right? It In many contexts, just like beti, right? That e at the end is the same uh, e at the end of this word, rusi. It can sometimes mean possessive suffix, meaning mine or my. Okay, you'll know it through context. If it's hagever harusi, is not my Russian guy, it's the Russian guy. Okay, I know that through context. I can figure that out. And then we have feminine, right? We have rusit, rusia, and yaldonet. So we're taking the same two suffixes as before, the e and the on, and we're plugging it into feminine, right? So the feminine version of e at the end of a word can be either it or ia, and on turns into onet. Okay, so when we get to uh, instead of Rusi for a woman or for something feminine, you would say Rusit or Rusia. And instead of uh, the feminine version of Yaldon is Yaldonet. Okay, so two ways that you can uh, do gender here. But the point that's very important here again, when you see these endings, you know 9.7 times out of 10, the gender. If it's row two and it ends with E or on, it's always gonna be masculine 9.7 times out of 10, maybe more. If it's it, ia, or on it at the end of a word, it's more than 9.7 time, 9.7 out of 10 times gonna be feminine. Now, within that, you see that I put it and ia because this is an, a question we get a lot. Um, from people who are learning Hebrew early on. Well, wait a minute, Jay. I've heard the endings both it and ia, right? I've heard the words rusit and rusia. What's the difference between the two? I'm going to explain it really fast, really quick for you to understand, and you'll never get confused again. Rusit is like the language rusit, right? When we talk about languages, we talk about anglit, ivrit, svaradit, Spanish, tsarfatit, French, and rusit. Okay, Russian. The it at the ending of a word always will indicate an object, something that is not human. So in the case of Rusit, Rusit stands for Hasafa Harusit, the Russian language. We simply just say Rusit, Russian. Okay, but it stand when you see the word. So for example, Hasimla um, Harusit, uh, the Russian dress. Okay, non-human gets eat. Whereas in proper Hebrew, if you're talking about a woman or someone who identifies as female and is Russian, we would say Rusia. Ha'isha ha'rusia lavsha simla rusit. The Russian woman wore a Russian dress. Okay, that's the difference. Okay, rusit, rusia. Rusit is an object, Rusia is human. Now you will always hear native Hebrew speakers mix these two up. Don't worry about it if you do the same, it's really okay. Just know you have the proper Hebrew under your belt now. It at the end of a word is feminine object. Iya at the end of a word is feminine human. Okay, and onet means the same thing as on. It's a, the, the fancy word in Hebrew, in English rather is diminutive. So if you need to make something diminutive, smaller in size, that's what it means. You just add on it on it. So yaldon, feminine turns into yaldonet. Okay. One more term that is gender, then we're going to start getting into gender-free stuff. So first I want to get to something that's more inclusive rather than gender-free, which is how do you say ladies and gentlemen in Hebrew? Very simple. 
Um, not, it's, it's a little hard to say actually for first um, for some native English speakers, but <clears throat> I think you'll get used to it or at least you'll recognize it when you hear it is gvirotai verabotai. You've probably heard this a lot. If you've flown on LL when they do their safety videos, they, this is how it begins. This is a very formal thing, right? Just like how ladies and gentlemen is very formal in English. We don't always use it. Same thing in Hebrew, but it's very inclusive. Gvirotai verabotai, ladies and gentlemen. It literally translates to my ladies and my gentlemen. Okay, but we don't normally speak like that. Also, whether rabotai, more that rabotai translates indirectly to gentleman. It doesn't actually mean a gentleman in the same way that English has the word gentleman. Different topic altogether. Before we get into gender-free, I need to remind you of a very important term in grammar. We've done this term before, but it's very important to understand what we're going to go through with gender-free expressions in Hebrew is what we call shem hapoal. Shem means a name. Right? It can also mean a noun, but it also means name. Poal is a verb, right? It literally means action. So shem ha poal, the name of the action, is the word that we is the expression that we use in Hebrew to uh, indicate an infinitive verb. An infinitive verb, for those of you who don't remember language arts, is to do, to be, to act, to speak, to talk to sleep, to eat, to drink, right? It's the infinitive. It has no time boundaries on it. It has no conjugation. It has no time constraints on it. It's infinitive. It is exactly what infinitive means, right? So the way we're gonna work around um, using conjugation is we have to use the infinitive. Right? The moment we conjugate, we have to specify not just time, but also space, which gender we're talking about. When we use the infinitive, there's no uh, conjugation involved whatsoever. And when you're learning Hebrew verbs, you always have to learn the infinitive because it's used quite often, just like we do in English, right? Um, I have to go to the store. To go is infinitive. It's to go is an infinitive verb, right? It's um, modified by using all the words around it, right? Have and to the store, but to go itself is just an infinitive. In Hebrew, we would use the exact same thing. Ani tsarich la lechet la makolet, or la chanut. La lechet is the infinitive verb, right? Same exact thing in Hebrew as it is in English and many other languages. So let's look at some of these expressions. You don't have to worry about grammar, uh, gender whatsoever. And with each of these, as you'll see in the blue, I've given you an example sentence that we'll go over together. Okay, so let's start. On the right-hand side, the Hebrew with the nikud, the bars and dots that indicate vowels, transliteration in the middle, English and notes on the left. So let's start with the first one. We've done some of these before, right? Let's start with row 10, yesh. Yesh plus shema poal. Yesh, many of you have learned, means there is, right? Yesh li means I have, but it literally translates as there is to me. Yesh, when, when followed by shema poal, when followed by the infinitive verb, becomes a command. Yesh, as you see here in row 11. Yesh la'atot masecha. One should or one must wear a mask. Okay, before anyone asks for the 500th time how to say to wear a mask properly in Hebrew, I beat you to it. You're welcome. Yesh la atot masecha. One must or one should wear a mask. Okay. When you do yesh plus the infinitive, you create the construct of one, one can, one must, one should. And inherently by using the word one, I'm, I'm further emphasizing this is gender free. Right? There's no gender involved whatsoever. And it therefore applies to everyone. Right? I would say to an individual, as I would say to a group, regardless of how, what gender each of them includes, yesh la tot masecha. One must wear a mask, okay? No gender involved. Your first example, you will do this. And again, I, 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 before anyone asks, it's not that you can create a complete conversation without gender. You're never gonna be able to do that in Hebrew. So let's get that out of your minds if you're thinking that's gonna be the case. Sorry, not sorry, that's not the case. 
These examples are at the very least gonna give you a respite, are gonna give you a break as your mind is frantically trying to get used to conjugating all the time and all the different words you're using, these sentences, these um, expressions will give you a little bit of pause. Let your mind slow down, relax a bit, your mouth slow down a little bit also hopefully and recalibrate, right? Because you don't have to worry about gender. For however many words you can string together using these expressions, you don't have to use gender. So you get a break. Break is always a good thing. Okay, so we did yesh plus shema poel, which, which means one can or one must. What's the opposite? En plus shem hapoel. Okay, so just as yesh, the opposite of yesh is en, there is yesh, there isn't en. Same thing here. If one should wear a mask, yesh la'atot masecha, how do we say one should not do something or one cannot do something or one mustn't? do something. Mustn't is a good word. We should use that more often. Okay. Here's how you would say En lehikanes lelo atiat masicha. Okay. I told you we would still have to talk about that fakakta virus. En lehikanes lelo atiat masicha. One cannot or one should not enter without wearing a mask. En, in this case, plus the infinitive, which is lehikanes. Lehikanes means to enter. So en lehikanes, one cannot enter. Lelo, uh, lelo is the same as bli, so without. Atiat masicha. Atia is the verbal noun of laatot. So if laatot is to put on, in this case, a mask, atia is the act of putting on. Masecha mask. So one cannot enter without putting on a mask. Okay, or one cannot enter without wearing a mask, as I put here on the left-hand side. Okay, en lehikanes lelo atiat masecha. Okay, so yesh plus shem hapoal, one can or one should. En plus shem hapoal, one cannot, one should not, one mustn't. Okay. Let's move on to another way we can avoid gender. Efshar plus shem hapoal. We've talked about efshar, I think, for the last few weeks consecutively. This is a really good one that you're going to use quite often, probably more than en veyesh. En veyesh are more like commands. Efshar you're going to use all the time because efshar is our very polite way to address someone, either generally and indirectly or directly. Okay? Efshar plus shema poal. So here we go. Efshar li kanes bli masicha. May one enter without a mask? Okay. Efshar li kanes bli masicha. Efshar li kanes. Is it possible to do something? Or may, in this case, because we're asking a question, um, may one do something? Or if it wasn't a question, it is possible to do something, or one may do something, okay? It's just because of that question mark, we changed the order of the words in English, but it's the same exact thing, okay? No gender involved. You see there's absolutely no conjugation in these sentences, none. If shall, it is possible, or is it possible? Lehikanes, to enter. It's again that shema poa, the infinitive verb. Bli, without, masicha, mask. No conjugation whatsoever, and I put a whole thing together. Okay? Very good sentence to have under your belt. Okay. Um, sorry, I just need to close that window there for me. Okay. Next one. Asur. Asur or asul in Hebrew means forbidden. Okay, asul, asur, forbidden, means it on its own. You, and this word will, um, as opposed to our other examples up till now, asul, meaning forbidden, can also conjugate on its own, right? So, um, because it's an adjective. If something is forbidden, it's an adjective. Forbidden is an adjective. So you would normally conjugate this as asul, asura, asurim, asurot. We're not conjugating, right? So you don't have to worry about that. If I just do asul, right, the male version, the masculine version of it, plus shema poal, again, that same construct, we take a word and we 
have it followed by the infinitive. So asur plus shema poal. Um, it's simply because it's forbidden to do something. Asur li kanes layam. Okay, asur li kanes layam. It is forbidden to go into the water. Okay, oftentimes this will be written differently. Um, it'll be written, sometimes you'll hear it as haknisa layam asura. Right, so now we're not using the infinitive, we're using that verbal noun, haknisa. Knisa is the act of entering. And asura now be, has to become uh, conjugated, right? Because it's no longer likanes, it's knisa, which is feminine. We're not doing that. I'm just giving you how to do no gender, which is asur likanes layam. Okay, I can say this as a statement. I can say this as a question. The point though is there's no conjugation involved whatsoever and I'm completely understood. It is forbidden to go in the water. Asur li kanes la yam. Asur forbidden, li kanes to enter, yam, the sea or water, water meaning the sea or an ocean. La is the preposition to or into the. Okay, asur li kanes la yam. The opposite of asur, is the word mutar. Mutar or mutar, depending on how you say resh, the letter resh means the exact opposite. Okay, so mutar, um, also same thing as asur. Mutar, muteret, mutarim, mutarot, but we're not conjugating here, right? We're just using the word mutar plus shema poal, plus the, the infinitive verb. So example sentence, number 19. Haim mutar lin sham. Okay, is it possible? Is it allowed to travel there? We've talked about this word haim. Haim is the fancy formal Hebrew, the fancy formal way in Hebrew that we start a question that doesn't begin with a question word, right? That doesn't begin with who, what, when, where, why, or how. Could you, would you, can I, may I, should I, all of that. Whenever a question in Hebrew doesn't begin with one of the regular question words, we use ha'im. Now, in modern, everyday, informal Hebrew, you will not use ha'im. Okay, so if you're speaking to friends, if you're speaking to family members, do not use ha'im. It's very formal. In the workplace, absolutely feel free to use ha'im. If you're speaking to a colleague in a friendly context, don't feel obligated to use ha'im. It's still very formal. But if I wanted to ask this properly, um, I could say ha'im mutar lin sham. Is it possible to travel there? Mutar, possible or allowed. Lin soa is to travel a long distance. And sham, there. Okay, no conjugation whatsoever. Um, one last one, and this is very much from informal Hebrew, if not slang, um, which is always good. Slang is a really important part of any learning any language because it's the adaptation of the language over the years into how it's used on an everyday, excuse me, basis. So you've probably had this happen before. You're at the end of a meal in Israel. You're with a bunch of friends who are native Israelis. You have fought over the check already multiple times. You've stretched out that last, last cup of coffee or that last piece of cake or whatever you're sharing. And then it's very clear it's time to go. And you get um, a situation like this. And you can't see my hands, but let's say my hands are, um, let's see if you can, uh, I'm going to try to um, recreate this situation. Yala, zeo, siamtem, yala, zaznu. Zeo, siamtem. Yala zaznu. Zeu means that's it. Siamtem, you finished, meaning you're looking at everyone, but also including myself. We've all finished. Siamtem, but it's really meaning you finished. Yala, you know what that word is. Yala zaznu. Zaznu literally translates as we left or we went or we moved. We moved is more appropriate. But zaznu in this context, in a slang context, translates best as let's go or the um, bastardized Spanish and English vamos, right? Vamos. It's the same construct, by the way, as vamos in Spanish, right? When we use first person plural in Spanish, we're inclusive of everyone and there's no gender involved because that's how that 
case works. Same thing here. When I say zaznu at the end of something or at the end of a meal, or if we're at a party and we decide to leave, zaznu means let's go. Literally we, means we moved, but it's the context of we've, we've been here already, been here, done that, let's go. Okay, so again, no gender whatsoever. It does have to conjugate because it's zaznu, but it doesn't have any gender involved because zaznu is inclusive, whether it's two, three, five, 400 people, and regardless of the gender um, composition there. Okay, so zaznu um, simply means let's go or vemus. You can do this with only a few other words. Um, hayinu, we also use in the same context of yalla hayinu. We were already here, let's move on. Been there, done that. Um, it's hard to do this with a lot of other things, but zaznu is the way we use this construct the most in everyday informal Hebrew. Um, it's a good one uh, to use. Or uh, for example, when you've um, uh, confirmed a time to meet with someone, whether it's professional or personal, whatever it may be, you'll often say at the end, yala sagarnu. Sagarnu means we literally we closed but it means like we've we've picked a time. We're done. We've 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 closed up the schedule. We've closed up the negotiations. We're done. Okay. So same idea here. We use the first person plural past tense. Anachnu is how we say we in Hebrew. Zaznu, hayinu, sagarnu, all of these things. Now we're going to go on to examples that are gender inclusive, not gender free. And you're going to see the difference in a moment. They're gender inclusive, meaning you still have to conjugate and you're still going to use one gender's conjugation over another. Um, but it's the meaning of it is gender inclusive. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I'm going to start off with an example you probably all know. The moment you start learning Hebrew, you learn this question. Echomrim blank. Or echomrim blank banglit or beivrit. How does one say blah blah blah? This is the way we're taught. Very early taught. I'm not from New York. Taught. Um, this is the way we're taught to um, ask a question and specifically ask the meaning of a word or the translation of a word um, from one language to another. How does one say? Right. That one that using one in English is the same construct as using one in Hebrew, meaning that there's no gender involved, there's no conjugation involved. But as opposed to the English one, meaning we're referring to one, in Hebrew we use the plural, right? Great way to think about it. One is how we would say it in English. We use the plural in uh, Hebrew, okay? So echomrim would in English translate to how does one say? You can best translate this literally into English as how do they say? Meaning how do the general population say the following word in a given language? So echomrim, uh, echomrim helicopter bevrit, right? Echomrim, excuse me, echomrim hangover bevrit. Echomrim, I'm trying to think of random words off the top of my head. Um, okay. That's how we ask how to know a question. And now again, omrim is conjugated and it's conjugated for plural mixed gender or plural all male. But the meaning in Hebrew, not just its translation, the meaning in Hebrew is gender inclusive. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so that's what I mean about here. These aren't 100% gender free. There is conjugation involved, but the meaning is understood in both languages to be devoid of um, gender and thus gender free. Um, here's another way to use that exact same verb. Lomar means to say. We just use how does one say. Here's another way to do it. Omrim she. Omrim she. Omrim she. Ster tufa lo yisager. They they're saying or they say that the airport won't be closed. Okay, omrim she. We're using the exact same verb, say, but in the plural, plural. And here it translates better into English, right? They say that. Okay, they in English is, there's no gender involved, right? In Hebrew, there is. 
right? When we're using the verb, the word they in Hebrew, we have to either say hem for all male or mixed gender or hen, just women. But omrim, we can just say omrim she, omrim she. We don't have to put a, um, a pronoun before it. And it's understood to be the general population. General society says that or the word on the street is that. Maybe that's a better way for many of you to, to understand this construct. The word on the street is, okay? Or how does one on the street say blah, blah, blah? Okay, and now here's another way. We're using that same root of, um, from Lomar, and we're using it, um, it's uh, participle. If you remember several weeks ago, we talked about participles and the construct of past tense. So here it is, amurim. Amurim is the mixed gender or all male conjugation of amur. Amur, amura, amurim, amurot. It translates into English as supposed, supposed. Okay. Comes from the same exact root as lomar, to say. It has been said, right? Amurim liftoach et achanut mechadash. Lo? They're supposed to open the store a new, right? Amurim works the same way as Omrim. It's a general they. We don't know who they are. It could be one person, it could be two people. It could be a woman, it could be a woman and a man, it could be all women. The point though is we don't know. And when we don't know, we can conjecture using the mixed gender or all male plural, but we understand in its context that we're being gender inclusive because we simply don't know. There's not enough to go on to indicate anything. And so we're using this not as a placeholder. It is a placeholder actually. We're using it as a placeholder instead of having more spe um, specifics about, to, about whom we're speaking, right? So amurim liftoach tachanut mechadash lo. They are supposed to, they, again, we don't know. So we're just using it in a general they, right? They're supposed to open, liftoach is to open, et hachanut, the store, and we use et because it's a direct object, not any, just any store, that store. They're supposed to open the store, mechadash, anew, comes from the word chadash. New, me means from, lo, no, right? So amurim liftoach et hachanut mechadash, lo. They're supposed to open the store anew, right? Again, we don't know they. This is simply holding a place for the gender we can figure out later. Maybe it won't be. Maybe the answer will simply be Ken Shamati Omrim She, right? The answer could be Ken Omrim She Potrim et Hanut Mechadash, right? Listen to what I said. Ken Omrim She, they say that Potrim et Hanut Mechadash, they're opening the store anew. They say that they're opening the store anew. The two days are two different days, right? The they is the people on the street. And the other they is the store owners. It could be the same they. The point is it's so ambiguous, it's inherently gender free. The only part that's gender is the specific conjugation we use here with amurim, omrim, for a uh, for, uh, mixed gender or all male plural present tense. Okay, that was a lot of grammar and a lot of gender. Um, one question I do want to get to before I take some questions, um, and someone actually asked me before we started, is what are other ways to get around gender? And in Hebrew, in modern Israel, we have a much greater awareness of um, the role of gender. It's growing, certainly. Um, one example of gender being used um, in an inclusive way by doing the opposite is um, slang, and more specifically, gay slang. We've talked about slang before. Um, in Hebrew, like in other languages, but more specifically in Israel, we have a subculture within slang, which is gay slang. The um, slang that's used among LGBTQ Israelis, that is um, like all sort of forms of slang, also a secret language, so that the mainstream doesn't know who they are, um, doesn't catch on to them, keeps them a relatively safe. And in gay slang, um, one of the trends is that everything is turned into the feminine, right? So when you learn Hebrew, you're told that the default is always masculine, right? When you learn verbs, you always learn past tense, 
third person singular male. Who avad, he worked. Who katav, he wrote. Who amar, he said. Who dibel, he spoke, right? In gay slang, everything, regardless of who's speaking and to whom you're speaking, turns into the feminine. So it's really playing on the use of gender in, in the, the, the queer aspect of LGBTQ, the Q in it. Um, so everything becomes feminine. I would address someone or someone would address me in feminine. Um, there's pushback to that, but the point is that it's playing around with some of these norms. The other one that you'll see, and it's a lot easier to write than it is to speak, is that at the end of words, because again, like we talked about at the beginning here, right, that gender often comes in the form of a suffix at a word, that we simply um, put gender at the, um, we add both things. Right, so if you're reading a letter or something that's gender inclusive, it'll often look like this. And I'll write it in Hebrew and then chem, chem, or boom, chem, chem, or shlom, um, or tal midi. Okay, let me just get this bigger so you can see this. This is an example, not what we were talking about today, but still in the realm of um, gender inclusivity and gender free, what oftentimes you'll see. Um, so if I want to ask, how are you doing students? You would say, mashlum chem chen, and you would either spell it like I did here, mashlum chem chen, or chen chem, depending on which um, order you want to do masculine and feminine, you'd make it one word. And you make it clear that the first one has that final letter. So I wouldn't change that. As you see here, shlom chem. And same thing with the next version. I'll put a slash or a dot in between the two. And then the last one we've actually seen at a lot of um, schools, understanding the need to start educating about um, gender and being inclusive, talmidim and talmidot. But instead, we will see talmidimot, right? It's not trying to create a new gender. It's just trying to create, instead of two separate words, one separate word. You don't have to agree with anything I'm saying now. These are phenomenon in Israel. It's like teaching curse words. When I get pushback saying, I don't want to learn the bad words, you got to learn what's happening in Israel in order to be a part of it. Okay, with that, let me stop and answer questions. As you see, we have a bunch in the Q&A. Okay, Debbie asks, which Hebrew word corresponds to where? La'atot. Okay, it does, and that's in that um, uh, sentence, Debbie. Let me just pull that back up here. Um, La'atot, right? Let's do that. Um, it does here mean la'atot. La'atot, sorry, just one second. Can't see myself here. Okay. Yesh la atot masecha, right? Yesh means one can, one should. La atot is the verb, so wear. And masecha, mask. Okay? La atot in this context means to wear a mask. It is only to wear a mask. Um, we've talked about this before in Hebrew. Hebrew, for being such a conservative language, has many, many verbs for different articles of clothing. You know two of them in everyday Hebrew, which is lil bosh, which is simply to wear any piece of clothing, and lin ol, which is to put on a shoe. There are other ones. La atot masecha is one. Lach bosh kipa, to put on a kipa. And there are even more than that. But for this context, I, it's important to say to wear a mask. You would not use la atot for any other article of clothing except a mask. Okay, but very good question. Okay. Um, Anonymous asks, what's the difference between yesh plus the infinitive versus tsarich, the infinitive? Great question. Tsarich has to be conjugated. I'm talking here about gender free. So yesh, there's no gender. Tsarich has to be tsarich, tsricha, tsrichim, tsrichot. If you don't want to deal with gender, you don't have to use with tsarich. Tsarich, for those of you who don't know, means need, right? I need tsarich la atot masecha. I need to wear a mask, right? 
It's a very different sentence. Or tzichim latot masicha. You all need to wear a mask. Versus yesh latot masicha. One must wear a mask. Same meaning, same spirit of the meaning, right? But no gender when I use yesh. There's definitely gender when I have to use tzarich. Okay, that's what we're talking about here in this, in this session today, folks, gender. But otherwise, the meaning is almost exactly the same. Um, Anonymous asks, when would you say lo plus the infinitive versus ain plus the infinitive? Okay, lo before um, an infinitive is a command. You are yelling at someone. Lo lehi kanes layam, exclamation point. Okay, whereas ain lehi kanes layam is also a command. It's just not as um, forceful but you would not go around speaking to complete strangers unless you are being threatened or threatening them by saying lo lehikanes, lo, lo plus an infinitive. It's very, very aggressive speaking, okay? Cam asks a great question that is very complicated even for native speakers. Why lelo versus bli? It's very complicated. Um, You'll just, we all learn it by doing it. There is no um, real set rule. And if there is, it's very archaic. So Jeffrey asked the same question. Um, that's the, just go with it when you see it. If you make a mistake, don't worry about it. Lilo and Bli are very interchangeable. They're considered synonyms in Hebrew. Don't worry about if you use one versus the other, they both mean without. Aviva asks, can you use Yifshar instead of Asur? Um, Aviva, it's the same thing as in English. If shall means it's impossible. Asul means forbidden. Just like in English that we have two different words, impossible and forbidden, we have the same in Hebrew. If what you're saying is actually it's impossible, um, by all means use it. But if you wanna say forbidden, Asul is your guy or gal as it were. Uh, okay. How to say it is forbidden for us to go into the water than you, Lila. Okay, well, Lila, again, we're only going over gender-free things here. Okay, if I wanted to put gender into, what sentence was that? Um, if I wanted to put gender in here, I would say It is forbidden to us to enter the water, okay? That's how I would add, making it specified by adding a person into it, right? It's forbidden to us or to go into the water, which in proper English would be, we are forbidden to go into the water. Okay, but we're just talking about gender-free things. The moment I have to put lanu, lach, lecha, la, any of that stuff, I've added gender, I've added conjugation. I'm trying to take gender away from you guys for just a little bit from you folks to remember you don't have to use it all the time. Okay, uh, Mark asks, I've seen new Hebrew letters that are multi-gender. For example, a composite letter made from a Yod and a Vav that could be used for both male and female. Is this a thing or is it marginal? Great question, Mark. So that refers to what I was doing at the end, right? With Tami Dimot. There is a, um, there's actually a woman, there's a woman who started several years ago actually doing this in a different way. She um, came up with a system of letters that allow you to write Hebrew and Arabic as the same word. And they basically link um, top and bottom. And she created this whole new constructed alphabet called Aravrit, um, Aravit Ivrit, Aravrit. Um, and the style caught on among people trying to be gender inclusive. So of linking letters by doing it vertically as opposed to horizontally. So yeah, it's not something that's caught on. Um, you'll see it in a few places, but it's understood because you can read it very clearly, um, or at least it's made to be as clear as possible, but that's not something mainstream enough that's accepted in terms of, certainly there's no font for it yet. It's very, um, eh, eh, um, stylized, you have to design it. Okay, Aviva asks, can you use can instead of low in uh, 25 as right? Um, um, 
Lo. Uh, in Hebrew, when we ask these types of questions, um, if you want to say right at the end of it, you would say nachon. Nachon means correct, um, as meaning right in English. We wouldn't use ken. It's the, the think of like stereotypes of Eastern European speaking people or even Middle Eastern speaking people where everything um, ends with no. Um, uh, it's good bargain, no? Like as stereotypical as that sounds, that's how we speak in Hebrew as well. It's usually when we're um, trying to uh, persuade the person to answer one way or another with a yes or, no yes or no question, we're usually doing it low. You will hear people say, Ken, I'm a low kind of guy. I think most of the time you'll hear low. Um, but uh, the default I would stick with is low. Um, anonymous. Thank you, but there's absolutely no way we can condense this to 30 minutes. That's why all of these lessons for the, as a fifth reminder to everyone, are recorded and will be up on the YouTube channel. You can watch it and review them at your leisure. So if by 30 minutes, it's too much. Tomorrow, the next day, come back to YouTube. You'll be able to keep up, watch it on demand whenever you would like. Um, Susan, can you say because I wouldn't know how to conjugate atiat? Okay, Susan, unless you own a store, you're never going to need to say this sentence. Okay, let, I, and this is something we've talked about in the last year and a half, but I'm thank you, Susan, for bringing it up again. Folks, please do not be civilian police. Okay, the pandemic, unfortunately, is still going on. Um, they are trying to strengthen the rules with regards to when and where to wear masks, but you are not um, policemen and police women. And there have been multiple accounts of violence taking place when people have asked complete strangers to put on masks. So please don't. I'm just giving you sentences that you'll hopefully find at the, at the um, entrance to stores or not. So you don't need to know how to conjugate la tot to atia. You just need to be able to recognize when you see a sign that atia and la tot are related the same words meaning to, to wear, but you're never gonna use that. And if you're a store, by the way, if you're a store owner and you're on this call, I will gladly hook you up with a more intensive business Hebrew class. This is not for you. If you already have an actual storefront, let me help you elsewhere. Um, Miriam on the Nefesh Benefesh YouTube channel, are the lessons dated, meaning if I missed last week, absolutely. Um, if you're not familiar with YouTube, Miriam, you always see at the bottom, at right under a um, video, it says when it was updated, when it was uploaded or updated. Um, like I said, all of the videos here on Cafe Olay are uploaded within 24 to 36 hours after we're done here. So you'll be able to see uploaded 36 hours ago versus uploaded last week, two weeks ago, and so forth. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Yitra is asking, how do I say good night and how are you? Very basic, but happy to always go over this. Good night is Laila Tov, as meaning you're not going to see the person again. Right? It's wishing someone a good night, meaning that's the end of the night for at least one of you is Laila Tov. If you want to say Erev Tov, that's good evening, meaning if I were to see someone right now in a formal setting, I would say Erev Tov at nine o'clock, almost nine o'clock here at night here in Israel. How are you? There are multiple ways to do that. Let's go over that another time, um, Ita, but thank you for the question. Miri, I'm confused about the meaning of Amura. Does it correspond to they are said to? It means they're supposed to. Amura means supposed. S-U-P-P-O-S-E-D. We can translate it in a very figurative sense as they, are, they have said, they are said to. But amul means supposed. Okay. Shane asks, would that also be used to wear a mask on Purim? La'atot, no. La'atot masicha, we are only using um, when it comes to a mask with that. We use um, a we usually use the word to dress up in a costume when we're talking about a mask. Let's wait for Purim for that because you usually don't dress up in a costume elsewhere during the year. Um, May asks, uh, how does a woman say, I feel good health-wise? Ani margisha batov. Ani, I, margisha, which is the present tense feminine 
of lehorgish to feel. So I feel betov. I feel well. Okay. In Hebrew, we don't have a set way to create adverbs, and just like in English, I feel well, ani malgish betov, or I feel good. I'm not going to get into grammar police when it comes to English. Debbie asks, what about al? Okay, so al is a command. When you say to someone, don't do something, exclamation point, that we often use the verb, the, the word al, followed by the present, the future tense, excuse me, of that verb. But Debbie, once again, you have to conjugate if you use al. Al tagid li etze. Al tagidu etze. Al tagidi etze. I have to conjugate. I'm giving you all here gender free ways. Al is a great expression. It's very aggressive, but it also requires conjugation. Um, Ola, can't people use tzarich in a general sense? No. Ola, it's a great question, but no. Tzarich la tot is a, um, uh, it's, it's just not good Hebrew. You'll hear people say it. If you want to use tzarich, you can say tzrichim la tot But again, you have to conjugate. Yesh la tot no conjugation. Mark, have we dropped feminine verb forms? Like, I'm not going to even say it aloud to confuse you all. In modern Hebrew, modern Hebrew folks, not biblical, not classic, not Talmudic, not poetic. There is only in the future tense, um, male and female, singular and plural. And um, for the future, for female plural, there's only Hem uh, and hen yelchu. They're, they're conjugated the exact same way for they will go. And you will go telchu and telchu. Atem telchu, aten telchu. Um, what Mark wrote in the question, and I don't think everyone can see the question, which is good. I don't want to confuse you all. There is another conjugation, but you didn't hear that from me. Susan, no, I'm not asking about wearing masks, but can you use a double infinitive? Um, sorry, I need to scroll up and ask what you're getting. No, you cannot say that, Susan. Um, if you don't want to use lelo, you can say bli la tot masicha. That's one example. Bli la tot masicha. Okay. Um, Alex asks, no, that is incorrect. Na is the polite way to say please. It is not the same as to say na la tot masicha, folks, means please wear a mask. That is a very different sentence than yesh la tot masicha. Yesh la tot masicha means one must or one should wear a mask. One is very definitive, declarative, yesh la tot masicha, and one is very suggestive, na la tot masicha, please wear a mask. This one, you must. This is, please do it. Very different meanings. Okay, folks, no biblical Hebrew. I know for many of you that's a con uh, context and I'm very glad for you. But for modern Hebrew speakers that can often mess people up. So if biblical Hebrew is your construct, that is your context, that's great. Um, again, if you can see the Q and A's from other people, please disregard them. And please, if you wanna talk about biblical Hebrew, please do that in the chat. Um, I don't wanna confuse people. We have to consider them as different languages, as similar as they may sound and look, and especially with the same alphabet, but please, we need to consider them two separate languages. Okay, any last questions? I see a lot of people did not follow my instructions and wrote questions in the chat. I'm sorry, I don't have time to go all to them. Please, next time, um, folks on the call, please write your questions that we go over in this class in the Q&A box. It does make a difference. There's hundreds of you on the call and it's amazing there's so many of you. There's only me and I'm teaching and I'm monitoring and um, answering the questions. So please, Q&A next time. Let me just see if there's any that I can quickly go over in this very short time. No, sorry, there's so many questions I see here. Thank you all so much for the questions, but unfortunately I can't go over them because they weren't in the Q&A, they were in the chat and didn't have the question there. Okay, so if you have um, 
uh, any suggestions for further topics, please send them to us, Nefesh Benefesh um, email. Uh, next week, we'll be back with media literacy, how to read the news, especially if you are a beginner Hebrew student. So you can read the news no matter what your level of um, Hebrew is. And with that, todaraba. Thank you all so much. Again, the recording of this will be up on the YouTube channel of Nefesh Benefesh tomorrow or the next day. You'll be able to watch it um, at your leisure. And hope to see you all next week. Todaraba, lihitraot. Take care.